Welcome everyone to the service of worship from Knox United Church on this Sunday, February the 28th, on the second Sunday of Lent. Today is UCW Sunday, when we recognize the work of our United Church women. I'm the Reverend Linda Petrides, one of the ministers here at Knox, and this is Catherine Datt, our UCW president. Catherine. We welcome you today. We would like to thank Reverend Linda Petrides for being our guest minister this morning. We appreciate her presence and service here at Knox. I thank the women who are taking part in this service. Dana Thompson, Joanne Seeley, Nori Brockest, Edith Chantler, Susan Chaucer, and Margot Brown, and the UCW members of Units 1 and 2. I thank all of the women of the church for the many ways in which they serve this church and the community. I also want to thank Reverend Bright, Reverend Linda, Ross, Jane, Lanella and Manley, Tricia and Marg of the worship team for making this service possible. We now continue by lighting our candles. We light the Christ candle to acknowledge the presence of Jesus the Christ among us. We light the memorial candles to remember all the women who have served our church. We have come together in spirit to worship God and to celebrate the United Church women. We have come rejoicing, seeking comfort, inspiration, community, and insight. We have come to open ourselves to the power of God's presence in our midst. We have come to offer up the seasons and the turnings in our lives and to ask God's help in our learning and in our growing. As the UCW lights their candles, let us prepare ourselves to worship God together. Hello, I'm Catherine Dutt, the president of UCW. Dana Thompson is lighting a candle which represents the past and all of those women who have shown us the way. Joanne Seeley is lighting a candle which represents our present endeavors. Nori Brockest is lighting a candle which represents the women and their work and devotion to Jesus Christ in the future. Thank you. Welcome to UCW Sunday. I invite all the women of the congregation to join me as we repeat the UCW purpose. To unite the women of the congregation for the total mission of the church and to provide a medium through which we may express our loyalty and devotion to Jesus Christ in Christian witness, study, fellowship and service. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea. Day by day, his clear voice sounding, saying, Christian, follow me. Long ago, apostles heard it by the Yes. 
sake. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden store, from each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls us in cares and pleasures, Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by your mercies, Savior, may we hear your call, give our hearts to your obedience, serve and love you best. Please join me in the opening prayer. You touch our lives, God, in many ways. You raise us up when we feel down and discouraged. You ground us when we are flighty and on edge. You inspire us when we have lost a sense of who we are. You accompany us in the many and varied journeys we undertake day by day. Be with us in this time of worship and give us the direction we need to face the future with hope and energy. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Miss Jane here. Happy Sunday. Happy last Sunday of February. <laughs> but also happy UCW Sunday service. You know how special it is for all the women who are taking part in the service today. Thank you so very much. Makes it truly special. And Reverend Linda, who's doing the message today, we just can't wait to hear what she has to say. So let's just enjoy and embrace the service together. Now, for moment of discovery, well, I have a question for you. Who do you belong to? Hmm, something to kind of think about. Who do you belong to? Now, we could take this in many different directions, but the direction I'm wanting us to look at is we belong to our families, right? Many of my young friends out there might be saying, yep, I have my family that I have at my home, whether it's a mom and a dad or just dad or just mom or grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle, whomever, you've got a family that you're with. You also have your church family, our Knox family, you know, who we look forward to coming together virtually right now, but we can't wait to be back together in person, uh, hopefully in the near future. And whom else? Well, I've got my school family, you know, my colleagues that I work very close with every day. Um, and we rely heavily on each other for a lot of support and energy. <laughs> how many of you, you know, your colleagues where you may work? Um, how many of you have really close, close friends that you consider almost pretty much like family, right? We belong to lots of groups, lots of things that we like to be part of. How about the UCW, right? How many of you women out there are part of the UCW? Pretty amazing. Well, it feels good to be part of something, actually, when we say whom I belong to, the group I'm a part of, the organization, the family I am, feels good to belong to something. Now, those feelings of good and acceptance and so forth are wonderful. Are they always easy? Is it always sunshine and roses and happiness? I'm going to challenge you to say it surely is not, right? Yeah, sometimes it can be very challenging. You know, it can be difficult. It can be, can be heart-wrenching too, you know? I have this special little pillow and I was given it about 15 years ago when I got married. And that, of course, is something that I belong to, you know, the covenant of marriage and family that I've created with my husband. And we have this great little pillow that on one side it says, for better. You flip it over, of course, and it says, <laughs> for worse. So we have a standing little joke that, hmm, wonder what the pillow's going to say today. Is it a day for the better or is it a day for the worse? <laughs> But whatever the pillow says, it's still a day that we enjoy being together and getting through it together. And that's something that, you know, I want us to kind of just think about a bit today and be thankful for that ultimately we belong to God and we're part of God's family. All of us, all of our families, all of our church families, our work families, school families, we are all part of God's family. And God, you know, he is with us for better, for worse, 
rich or poor, sickness, health, you name it. God is with us and God loves us deeply and so wants us to love each other that way too. And something else that we need to keep working on is, you know, God loves us so much. Do we return that? You know, are we in it for the long haul with God too? You know, are we with him for better and for worse? It's something that we each need to kind of think about when we truly ask, you know, who do we belong to and what does that mean? You know, when you truly belong and you know that you're with your family through thick and thin, what does that look like and feel like and sound like? Because that's how we need to put that in with God too. You know, the, the effort we put in with our family and our friends and how we work things out and we spend time with each other, we need to be doing that with God too. So that's kind of my thought and challenge, moment of discovery time for you for this week is embrace the groups and families that you belong to. And I sure hope you have days that are for the better together. But be with God, spend time with God, and remember that he is with you for the better and for the worse. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Take good care. We'll see you next time. The scripture reading today is from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as your word is proclaimed, we may hear what you are saying to us today. Amen. The choices that a person makes can sometimes tell us something about their character, who they are. I was reminded the other day of a person that some of you may remember from children's television. His name is Bob Homme. He had a long and beloved career as the friendly giant. I remember him for his recorder playing. Do you remember him? The music, the stories, the lowering of the drawbridge, the little rocking chair. Well, after 26 years on the air and over 3,000 programs, his was the longest running children's television show in Canada. It was a unique show based on a simple format with just a few personalities, like Jerome the Giraffe and Rusty the Rooster. The show had a stubborn belief in the power of imagination and a fierce respect for children. Underlying it all was a powerful message, 
Everyone is welcome. All are valued and respected. What is less well known is that Bob Homme lived what he portrayed in his show. In his lifetime, he received repeated offers of money and worldwide syndication contracts, but he rejected them over and over because the sponsors were insisting that he market friendly giant play figures and other money-making possibilities from the show. Homme wanted to inspire and entertain children, not exploit them. Yet I'm sure the temptation must have been quite real. He could have made a lot of money, had a lot of power, making things a lot easier for himself. But he didn't turn his life in that direction. He kept to the values presented on his show, and he lived his life in harmony with those values. There are so many examples in life where people choose to turn their lives in one direction rather than another, even in the face of temptation. In today's story from the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is once again faced with temptation. This time, the, precious, the pressure comes from one of his closest disciples. In our story, the disciples of Jesus have been with him for some time now. They think that they've gotten to know him fairly well. They think they know who he is. They've seen him feed the multitude, heal the suffering, and they're feeling pretty good about following Jesus. But then, all at once, Jesus begins teaching them things that really don't fit into their perception of what they think Jesus is all about. He tells them that he must go to Jerusalem and he very plainly explains what will happen there. Jesus tells them that he will be rejected by the authorities, he will suffer, and he will be killed and after three days rise again. You can just see the confused look on the faces of those disciples, especially Peter, who's furiously shaking his head. But then Peter does what Peter typically does. He springs into action, pulling Jesus aside and says the things that are probably on everybody's mind. But Jesus wants nothing to do with whatever it is that Peter is saying. And it is then that the rest of the disciples witness the harshest retaliation they have ever seen from Jesus. Jesus turns his head and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You can almost see the tears running down Peter's face. Peter, who is only trying to help, who is only trying to shield Jesus from his suffering and death. Yet Jesus hears these words from Peter as if they are words from Satan. Satan, the ancient tempter who from the beginning of time has offered humans alternatives to following God's way. Satan, who at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, has already tempted Jesus in the desert to use his power rather than suffer. And now, here was Peter, like that same tempter in the wilderness, cornering Jesus on his own and telling him things. You can just imagine what it is that Peter is whispering. Don't go that route. It's too risky. Stay here. Things are good. We'll be successful here. Peter thinks he's offering Jesus a way out, a detour around Jerusalem with all of its risk of pain and death. And for a moment, perhaps, the possibility seems real to Jesus, real and to be desired. That is, before he shakes his head clear. However tempted Jesus may have been, he turns and says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are, not, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus is telling them that they are setting their minds on the wrong things. They are turning in the wrong direction. 
And he doesn't even give them time to let it all sink in. He just calls the rest of the crowds who have gathered there and tells them this. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. By now, you can imagine that everyone is shaking their heads. Why would Jesus turn down such a risky path, a path of suffering, when he could turn around and walk back to a cozy, popular, successful life? And why would Jesus call for more followers? Who in their right mind would follow someone like Jesus, risking their lives, always thinking about others first, listening constantly for the voice of God and God alone? Who would do that? Well, funny thing is, a lot of people would do that and have been doing that, and you know who they are. Since the beginning of this pandemic, there are doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals that have been with us every day. And whenever we leave our homes to buy groceries or medical supplies, prescriptions, or any other essential items, there are people there serving us, people who are, in fact, risking their lives. And there are other people like teachers and community workers who are also at great risk. Yet in spite of the risk, in spite of the temptation to choose a different route, to make things easier for themselves, these people choose to carry on. Around our church, we have lots of people like that. We have people who regularly attend to the needs of others, people who contribute financially, people who sit on committees, attend board meetings, all for the love of God as followers of Jesus. And it's not always easy. And then we have our UCW, United Church Women. Women who work tirelessly to keep us fed, keep us grounded in friendship, service, and love to keep us interested, not only in one another, but in the world around us, in world affairs, social justice, to keep us focused on our relationship with God so that we can move forward with our lives, doing what God wants us to do. And it's not always easy, especially in a world that is constantly challenging us to take a look at the values we hold to take a look at who we are and to whom we belong. Well, we know to whom we belong. Jesus, the Son of God, crucified and risen. And it is a risen Christ that continues to call each one of us, encouraging us to keep our lives turned away from temptation all the while loving us, caring for us, forgiving us, and helping us to lift values like respect, honesty, integrity. I suppose that Jesus could have listened to Peter on that day and then walked away in the opposite direction, but that's not what he does. Instead, he heads straight for Jerusalem and he invites us to go there with him. Our responsibility as followers of Jesus, means that we follow him on the road of life, open to his teachings, open to his love, learning and growing along the way. And in our learning, we grow wise. In our following, we grow obedient. And through our faith, the love of God shines in us down through the generations for all the world to see. I have one more story that I'd like to share with you. It's about the composer Giacomo Puccini, who wrote a number of famous operas. In 1922, he was suddenly stricken with cancer while working on his last opera, Turandot, which many now consider his best work. Puccini said to his students, if I don't finish Turandot, I want you to finish it for me. Shortly afterwards, he died. 
Puccini's students studied the opera carefully and soon completed it. Well, in 1926, the world premiere of Turandot was performed in Milan with Puccini's favorite student, Arturo Toscanini, directing. <laughs> Everything went beautifully until the opera reached the point where Puccini had been forced to put down his pen. Tears ran down Toscanini's face. He stopped the music, put down his baton, turned to the audience and cried out, thus far the master wrote, but he died. A vast silence filled the opera house. Toscanini picked up his baton again, smiled through his tears and exclaimed, <clears throat> but his disciples finished the work. When Turandot ended, the audience broke into thunderous applause and no one at that premier performance ever forgot that moment. Jesus died before he could finish his portrait of God. If we are truly disciples, followers, we will finish what Jesus came to do. We will live so like the master that others will see him in us. May we listen for God calling us into the future and in spite of the temptations that surround us, may we be ready to move forward with compassion, with faith, with love. And may we always remember who we are and to whom we belong. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, where we see scarcity, you see abundance. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to take the risk of following in your ways, that we may share the abundance that you give to us through your bountiful grace. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Let us pray. Loving and faithful God, you have called us to be your people, and we dare to listen, longing for your voice. We dare to believe that you may have some use for us as a community of faith. And so we give thanks for your confidence in us and for one another, companions on the journey. We pray for this faith family God, Knox United, our church home. This morning, we pray in particular for the United Church women as they continue to care for one another and to reach out to others. We pray that you would add your blessing of the Holy Spirit upon each one of us Make us everything you need us to be. Make us bold 
to declare your love in our actions and in our words. Help us, God, during these COVID restrictions that are keeping us close to home. For some, this means enforced idleness and loneliness. For others, the same tasks and duties fill the day, and that may involve some level of risk. Help us to see your ways, that we may innovate and persist to maintain healthy and positive relationships during these times. Help us to reach more often for the phone, type a short message to a friend, set up online face-to-face -face contacts, arrange socially distanced walks, drop a care package on a front doorstep. In these times of bitter cold, help us to remember the people in crowded homeless shelters without the usual meal programs. Help us also to remember all the people who have been struck by the coronavirus. We pray for those who are sick and those who are dying. We pray for their families and friends, for the medical responders and caregivers, that they may find strength, comfort, and healing. We pray for government officials around the world as they make decisions about distributing the vaccines. We pray for the children who are back at school and for their teachers and their parents. Now in the silence of our hearts, we pray for others who are on our minds today. May each one feel your loving embrace and be encouraged and comforted. We confidently lay before you, God, all of these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. that you see represent the women of our church who continue to reach out with devotion and commitment to all God's people who are all of us together. And now go with us, God, into the days ahead. Strengthen us for peace. Give us wisdom. Keep us humble. And may we live and work together to build a new and better world for tomorrow. Go in the name and in the peace of Christ. Amen. <laughs>